Right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Software Development for Games uh, Lecture 4. Um, I am just back from the gym Arr. and uh, hopped up in caffeine, so I thought I'd just get it uh, sorted out the way just now uh, while I'm relatively energised, um, so that's good. Um, what was I going to say? I'm going to have an engagement meeting uh, next week uh, with the uh, entire programme. Um, so for the, the second year, I'm going to make that Friday, so your normal sort of uh, day for software development for games. Um, and we'll have a, a Microsoft Teams meeting um, just to check in with everyone and make sure that the engagement process is going okay uh, and to identify uh, any issues. Um, so um, it's quite, quite an important thing to attend uh, if you can. Um, if people are identified as, as not engaging uh, in the course, um, then they, they have to uh, possibly be um, removed or contacted, that sort of thing. Um, so make sure that you do attend that uh, and make sure that uh, you, you tell me whether things are going well or not. So today we're looking at inheritance. I have a cracking lab for you this day um, and we have three sort of inheritance examples in the lab. So this is part of the, the, the assessment really. Um, so once again, it's a nice sort of pseudocody example that's relatively straightforward to follow. Um, so we have uh, in the, the, the first example, I believe it's a sort of uh, simple um, example of inheritance where it is, uh, I think it's an animal base class, and then the super classes are dog uh, and cat, and we've got Scooby-Doo um, and uh, Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger's cat, um, so it's quite funny. Um, and then uh, I think we're, we're doing a sort of example in, in video games, so we've got the, the, the base class of enemy, um, and um, then the, the super class of boss, uh, which inherits everything from enemy, but of course extends, that particular functionality, so we've got an example of that. And then at the end, uh, I've got this fantastic, brilliant uh, Sith example uh, from Star Wars. So you've got the Sith, uh, the Sith Lord, uh, which is a subclass uh, uh, extending uh, that particular uh, sort of functionality. Um, uh, and it's really quite awesome. So I've got uh, Darth Vader and Darth Sidious in there for you, and you'll love it. Um, and it's, it's all sort of part of the, the uh, assessment. Um, okay, so. We'll go through that in a moment though. Inheritance revision. As you learn by now, classes are the perfect way of representing uh, game entities. Um, and these have attributes and behaviours and the game entities are often uh, related as you all sort of know. So uh, inheritance can give us an additional way of expressing those particular uh, connections as well. Um, and can make uh, defining and using game classes a bit more intuitive. So it's really all to do with, with set of design, okay? So here's a sort of example. Um, here's my, oh, here it is here. Um, I got a, a Super Nintendo Mini, which I absolutely love. I have the Super Nintendo Mini. Um, and um, yeah, it's got a number of games on it. It's got the 20 games or something on it, all the, the sort of classic games that we, we enjoyed. Uh, I remember back in the day, The Legend of Zelda was, I don't know, but 40 quid or something like that to buy. Um, and uh, that, that was just one cartridge, and now this entire thing is, is 60 odd pounds. You get all these games on it. Um, but anyway, um, it's all good. Um, that's what uh, Zelda, uh, A Link to the Past, uh, used to sort of look like. Um, and all of these things are really sort of stored uh, in the same way, although graphics have become far more complicated. Um, the sort of underlying structure, I would imagine, hasn't really particularly changed that much. And that's how um, they can do sort of updates to games on, on iPads and mobile devices via patches and all that sort of thing. If you're a big fan of uh, Plant vs Zombies or something like that, they're always constantly doing a patch. Um, which means um, they, they just sort of uh, extend the functionality uh, in some way. Oh, the underlying functionality, the underlying mechanics are still there. Um, but they sort of paint over it with a, a new zombie or a new enemy or whatever. Um, so there we go, that's what uh, Zelda Link to the Past used to look like. Uh, look like. Um, and now, oh yes, I think this is either, uh, is it Ganondorf perhaps? Uh, or Agonon, uh, the, the, the wizard? Um, so um, th this is what, what video games used to sort of look like, retro video games in the, in the days of yore. Um, and now, um, they look exactly like this um, from uh, Zelda Breath of, of the, the Wild. So that's Calamity Ganon there. Um, and as you can see, all of these things are still s sort of stored in the same way. 
Granted, that's become more complicated in terms of uh, three-dimensional graphics, more immersive graphics, sound, etc., uh, and technology has sort of taken off. But the underlying sort of uh, data structures, the way of storing these things, uh, still remains, and it's built upon its all sort of inherited uh, functionality, um, encapsulation, object orientation, reusability of code. Programmers are lazy, completely and utterly lazy. Um, and essentially what they're wanting to do is reuse as much as possible. Um, so that's a sort of uh, example of that. Uh, another example, the evolution of Pokemon. So that, this is what the Pokemon Center used to look like in 1996. Here's what it looks like now in, in 2018. Once again, the sort of underlying storage of all of this, um, exactly the same. The functionality is more or less exactly the same. It's just become a bit jazzier um, in terms of graphics and looking good. And that's the way it sort of works. Um, because obviously as technology advances, they've got to build on these things. Um, and it is a progressive, uh, incremental, iterative sort of process. Yes? Um, so there we go. That's what the, the, the Pokemon Center sort of looks like now. So in this lecture, we're going to learn how to derive one class uh, from another, if you don't know how to do it already. Use inherited data members and functions. We're going to call base class member function. Um, having an object as part of another object, uh, that's quite interesting. Um, so uh, yes, we'll discuss that uh, at the end. Using base constructors uh, in, in the derived class as well. So there's a few things to, to look at. So inheritance, it is a key uh, aspect of object-oriented programming. The four pillars of object-oriented programming, I think we mentioned them last week, were uh, encapsulation, inheritance, uh, polymorphism, um, and abstraction. So those are the, 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 the sort of four pillars, and you'll be questioned on that in your uh, class test when it sort of comes along eventually. So one of the key aspects allows you to derive a new class from an existing one to extend uh, that functionality. Um, and it's the, the sort of core of, of reusability as well. So one of the pillars of object-oriented programming, a new class automatically inherits uh, the, the data members and the member functions of the existing class. So it's particularly useful uh, when you're wanting to create a sort of specialized version uh, of, of a particular class. So it's important to try and uh, sort of think of these things. Right, when we're talking about specialized versions, I love dogs, always love dogs, but Really, uh, and I've had a number of dogs throughout uh, my, my life. Um, okay, so this is the sort of base class when we're talking about dogs. All dogs are really, regardless of what they are, domestic breeds, um, are all uh, sort of derived from the wolf. Yep. And then we have, I've had a Rottweiler, had a Jack Russell, and I've had a Deerhound. Um, and they are all sort of derived from this, and they, the spe they're specialized versions um, of this particular breed. They all look different and they all have particular genetic traits and cats are kind of the same as well. Um, so if you look at Rottweilers, we used to march in the Roman army 2,000 years ago, the reserve was silly. Um, they have a very large cranial capacity, um, a very large, uh, a very strong bite as well. And despite the fact that they get a bad reputation for occasionally eating the odd child, um, they are in fact quite docile, um, low maintenance dogs, uh, and they have a bark um, that is, uh, has a particular sort of signature. So all these sort of genetic um, markers are, are, are in there, or genetic traits. And when they bark, they actually start by going, ooh, ruff, 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 ruff. they always sort of do that, Rottweilers. Um, so they, they, they are of a particular uh, kind. Um, and well, they, they, they were, nearly assimilated into the police force at one stage, um, but they were considered to be too docile uh, and they replaced them with Alsatians, which are a wee bit faster perhaps, and possibly a wee bit more vicious. Um, the next one here is a, is a Jack Russell. Um, they're originally bred for uh, killing rats, would you believe? Um, so they're, they're very, very sort of good at that. Um, they're good in sort of short uh, bursts uh, of speed. Um, very, very sort of grumpy little dogs as well. If you accidentally uh, step in a Jack Russell, it's like, they always growling at you, that sort of thing. Um, we had uh, a Jack Russell for many years, and it was just a, a, a little rabbit growler. Um, and they have weird sort of behaviours as well, where it would sit a biscuit in the middle of the floor and sit there and guard it, and, go, and anyone come near it, it was a, a case of, go, come near my biscuit. Um, anyway, 
fantastic. We also had a, a deer hound. These things are absolute poetry uh, in, in motion. Um, you see them uh, running uh, and it's absolutely wonderful the way their tails and everything sort of move when they're out in the field. Um, and we are so um, uh, sort of used to having uh, these d domesticated animals in our life that we forget what they are in fact genetically sort of originally bred for. And it's amazing to see that genetic program that's in, uh, programming that's instilled in them. So, I mean, uh, th there have been a few times where we've been out uh, in the country um, and it's a deer hound. So you think to yourself, deer hounds, what do they do? They, they, they chase deer and they trip deer. Um, and that's their entire job. They don't kill deer. All they do is go, Whoof, and the deer kind of goes, oh, and stumbles over. And that's where the hunter's supposed to come along and go, Poof, I blew you away. Um, so it's amazing when you forget all of that, um, how a, a, a sort of morning walk with your deer hound can turn into run, Bambi, run for your life. And you forget all of that. So, there, about, there, there were, uh, these were, were my uh, dogs. I don't know exactly what they're doing in this picture, but they look exceptionally guilty. Um, so we had a little Jack Russell, it was crabby as hell, uh, and we had a deer hound uh, that sort of, um, you know, went out every now and again and stalked the occasional deer. Uh, didn't kill anything, but there you go. That's the way it sort of works. Also had a Rottweiler, he was absolutely huge. He was my dog, he was brilliant, he was great for Jehovah's Witnesses uh, and all that sort of thing. So I mean, when they came to the door, any religious fanatic, he just went, Max, come to the door, you have five seconds to depart. Otherwise, I'll say release the hound. Um, so yes, specialized versions of dogs. This is a sort of uh, Labradoodle. Back in the day, pedigrees were supposed to be the big thing, uh, specialized versions, and now, um, sort of uh, mongrels are making a bit of a comeback. So Labradoodles, uh, very, very nice, and nice and curly, um, and uh, uh, incredibly. Labradors are very, very friendly, have a reputation for being incredibly greedy, getting very fat, um, they will uh, eat absolutely anything. Um, and then of course they cross them uh, with the, 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 the poodle, and then it sort of gets this um, sort of curly hair and nice aesthetic look. You of course get uh, the sort of specialised versions of Labradors uh, and things like that. So you get the Black Lab, Yellow Lab, and then the, the Chocolate Lab is probably the most expensive because it's the, the most sort of difficult to, to, to breed. Um, and then you get Poodles, this is just uh, becoming ridiculous now. Um, and then sort of, you know, uh, Cockapoos and all that sort of thing. Um, so Mongrels are making a bit of a, a comeback. Okay, so the point is, these are specialised versions of, of Wolves. That's all they are. Um, and when you're thinking of classes, um, you would have a sort of wolf class uh, and then you, or, or a dog class in general. And then all these different breeds of dogs would be uh, subclasses of that super class. So Rottweilers, um, deer hounds, Irish wolf hounds, that sort of thing. Jack Russells, they would all be particular specialized versions of that base class. So that's what I'm trying to sort of get across to you in that own way. Okay, example of inheritance from games. Consider an enemy class in a game which has a member function attack and the data member uh, damage or enemy damage. So a new class can be derived from a boss enemy which could inherit all of the functionality of an enemy and then to increase the difficulty of the boss uh, then you can have some form of special attack um, which uh, would have a sort of damage multiplier variable uh, to increase the inflicted damage and you can also have things like a, a sort of life multiplier and things like that in order to make the, the um, boss super hard to defeat. So if you're considering things like this, you've got the, the enemy, which is the super class, so you get uh, M damage and attack. And then you've got the, the boss, which is the subclass of the specialization. Um, and you have a damage multiplier and, and special attack. So let's sort of think about this. This is probably a bit of a bad example, to be perfectly honest. But we have uh, the, the Nine, right? And then of course we have Sauron. Um, not a great example. Let's just say the enemies are orcs. Uh, but I suppose that Sauron is a sort of big, huge, hard uh, variation of the Nine, the Nine. Okay, so there's a sort of example there. We have a, a sort of a Stormtrooper perhaps. Um, and then of course we have a sort of boss character uh, which would be uh, Darth uh, Sidious. Again, these aren't brilliant examples. I'm just trying to say these are kind of normal run-of-the-mill enemies. Fit them, they're unbeatable. Yeah. 
uh, normal run of the mill uh, sort of enemies, and then the bosses are in fact incredibly hard with specialized functionality that makes them uh, more difficult. So, why inheritance? Far less work. Um, you don't, uh, programmers are uh, very, very lazy, as I've mentioned. Uh, there's no requirement to redefine the functionality that you already have, so this is already sort of tested, which is good. Um, and once the base functionality is there, then there's no need to define it again. And that is exactly the sort of point I'm making with uh, the Super Nintendo, the Super Nintendo Mini. Uh, all of the base functionality, all of this uh, great programming has been tested through the course of time. So there's no point in actually changing it. All you're doing is you're giving it a sort of fresh coat of paint, uh, fresh ideas. You've got the underlying original functionality there. You're merely adding to it without disrupting it uh, and you're reusing it. So there's fewer errors. Um, already existing classes uh, have already been tested to make sure that they're uh, acceptable. Um, it's cleaner code because the code uh, isn't repeated. If you start to repeat code far, far, far too much, you've got to uh, eventually come to the, the, the question um, of this, there has to be a better way. Uh, and then you come to the epiphany of, yes, of course, there is a better way. And one of these better ways is these relative uh, base classes. And this is, of course, in fact, a bit cleaner. Now, this is an example, an inheritance example in C++. Feel free to start up C++ and fire these in and see, see what sort of happens. Um, so you've got the class enemy here. Um, it's got um, your uh, damage. You've got the, the constructor for the enemy as well, which just sets the damage to 10 immediately. Then you've got the sort of void uh, attack as well. Um, and that just says the attack inflicts so much uh, damage and that in, in C++ go into C sharp in a minute. Once again, I'm sort of showing you that C++ uh, is evil in comparison to C sharp. Then you have the uh, boss, which inherits from enemy, okay? So class boss, uh, public enemy, yes? Um, and that has a damage multiplier. You then have the boss constructor with the damage multiplier set to three, yeah? Um, and what you can then do is, um, you can say avoid a special attack, right, okay? So a special attack actually inflicts um, the damage multiplier and you also get access to, to this variable here, the M damage, from the original base class. So you can access all of that, or you should be able to um, when you're um, sort of typing your code. It should automatically, if you start to um, type in the name of a variable, it should automatically appear. And if it doesn't, then you haven't set up your classes uh, appropriately. So it should automatically all appear in front of you, okay? So you've got damage multiplier there. That's only in the uh, boss class, right? Then you get damage here, which is inherited from the enemy class, which you see uh, already, okay? Then you get your main. So you're creating an enemy. You've got enemy uh, one, okay? You can have enemy one dot attack, which is great. Then you're saying creating a boss character. So you've got a boss, uh, which is uh, a boss one, which is a type boss. But you also have boss one dot attack. So you can then get access to these particular methods in the um, base class as well. And you've got the uh, method in the, the, the new class, the, the specialized functionality. So that's C++. So you're instantiating objects from a, a, a derived class here, okay? Using inherited uh, members uh, uh, as well. That's not the way it sort of works there. Um, the arrows are off. So you're instantiating objects from a, a derived class. So here we go here. Um, and using inherited members from here. The arrows are slightly Alright, so uh, inherited example in C sharp to show you how uh, fantastic C sharp actually is. Um, so you've got your, your class enemy, you know, semicolons all over the shop. Um, so you've got your int damage, you've got your constructor enemy, which is damage uh, equals 10 or assigned to 10. And you don't have consts and stuff everywhere as, as C sort of demands. Um, then you've got your void attack, and then all you're saying is the attack inflicts so much damage, okay? Then, uh, this is far, far cleaner, so you get class boss, which uh, then inherits from enemy, that's fantastic. You've then got the uh, damage multiplier. You've got the constructor uh, for the boss, 
um, which set the, the, the damage multiplier for the damage multiplier. Now you can use the sort of this keyword again, but look at the um, sort of um, differences here in the case in order to differentiate the parameter that's passed in from uh, the actual uh, data member living in the class, okay? Then you've got your special attack. So you could then say special attack in blitz plus uh, the, the, the damage, okay? So you're in looking at the, 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 the damage from uh, this inherited class, and of course you've got the specialized functionality uh, in the derived class, okay? So pretty easy. Right, so this is the sort of C-sharp equivalent. You're creating an enemy, um, an orc, right? Uh, you've got the orc attack, then you create a boss called uh, Sauron, and um, you're passing in uh, the, the damage multiplier to him. You get Sauron attack, and you've also got Sauron special attack as well. So, that's better. That's where the arrow should be. The C++ example was way off. Instantiating objects from a derived class, great. Um, and using inherited members. Okay, I hope you So controlling access, when you derive a class from another, you can control how much access the derived class has to the, the, the base uh, class members as well. And you only really want to provide as much access as is necessary to the, the, the class members for the rest of your program. So you decide that, you uh, design that. Um, and you only want to provide as much access as is necessary to uh, as class members as, uh, as necessary, really. Um, okay, so you use the same access modifiers as before. So you've got public, private, and you've got a new one uh, protected as well. So look at these controlling access. Um, public members are accessible to all code in the program. Protected members are accessible only in their own class uh, and certain derived classes, depending on the access level used uh, in the inheritance. So do sort of uh, look into that. Private uh, members are only accessible in their own class, meaning that they are not directly accessible in any kind of derived class. Okay. So you can set all of these, you can set it to public, you can set it to whatever, or protected if it's a, a child class um, inheriting from a parent. So here's a, a sort of, um, I've seen this before. Oh yes, sorry, I beg your pardon. I'm trying to, to show you the uh, difference in the um, uh, accessibility. So before it was just public, but now it's uh, protected, okay? So you've got your public, uh, you've got your constructor, um, and you've got your uh, attack and everything like that. And then in, in protected, you've got the, the M damage um, data member, okay? So then you have your derived class, which is, is boss. Um, you've got your damage multiplier in the public, you've got your uh, attack and everything. Um, and then you've got something that's only accessible to the boss, which is the damage multiplier as well. Okay. Um, but because uh, this is in fact uh, a child of enemy um, and it's protected, you still have access to that. Okay. So that's to sort of uh, show you that. Once again, uh, we're looking at the, um, the scope here in particular. So you get protected damage. Okay. You get um, the constructor, the attack again. Um, and then once again, to sort of show you, you still have access um, to the uh, protected data member damage from the child class, but you only have access to the damage multiplier in the enemy class. So that's going to be private. So it's really uh, about the, the appropriate design units that you're wanting to use and when, of course, it makes uh, sense, okay? So once again, uh, uh, oh, I should have mentioned that if you fire all of this code into the coding window, it should all work. I think that um, the second example in the lab today is basically one of these. Um, so all you're sort of doing is for transposing the, 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 the code in uh, and everything should be uh, hunky dory. Okay. So we, there we have creating an enemy, you've got an orc, okay, uh, and then the exact same sort of thing um, will work again. Okay. But you're... Um, defining the, the, the scope and the accessibility, okay? You can call and override base class member function, so you're not necessarily stuck 
with a rebase class uh, member function um, inherited in a derived class you can overwrite them you can add new definitions um, so you've got that option and you can also explicitly call uh, base member functions from any member function uh, of, of your derived class which is a sort of handy little uh, piece of functionality so the reason for doing this would either to be extend uh, the, the way a member function of a base class works uh, in a derived class by overloading it um, the, the base class method uh, explicitly calling the, the base class method function and then from this uh, new definition in the derived class adding in some functionality okay making a new de declaration in a new class calling the base class and extending that functionality as well and um, so here's an example of a probably not a particularly good example but it's dark side and shell cams going down uh, and you've got a, an attack so it's a boss attacking and you can explicitly call uh, the attack from uh, the, the, the enemy class okay so all you have to do there is that's the c plus plus example that is uh, enemy um colon colon attack and you can have access to, to all of that as well um so that's quite good excellent so the lab today oh it's going to be awesome so you've got um a sort of Darth Sidious uh, example or a Sith example, right? So um, he's going to have his uh, weapons. Um, he has his apprentices as well, okay? So you've got uh, apparently your own. Two there are, never one, never more. There always seems to be two, even though he seems to be a, a, a bit of a cheat in that regard because he's in fact had three. Um, so yes, I don't know. Uh, Who knows? Who there are? Never one. A master and an apprentice. Okay, we'll go with that model. So Darth Sidious has had a number uh, of apprentices, but in the lab today we're only going to have Darth Vader up here, so he's only going to have one uh, apprentice. My happy apprentice. So we've got uh, Count Dooku here, Darth Maul and Darth Vader. And then of course he's got his force powers as well. So he's got his uh, lightning you know, Master Yoda you survive. So he's got his telekinesis. For some bizarre reason, he can also save people. You know, um, and I think I put that into the lab saying, there he is, in a medical capsule. He's still alive. I'll just put him into his black suit that I just seem to have lying around. Um, so he's got his uh, force push as well, and he has the ability to see into the future, as we all sort of know. So everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. Okay. So, sure. yes, that sort of equates to this, right? So we have um, Sith. So we're going to construct a Sith class with all of these data members, yeah, and all of these methods. Okay. So we'll have damage, which is going to be an integer. Title, which is going to be a string. Name, which is going to be a string, force power, which is going to be an integer, and lightsaber power, which is going to be a string. Okay. Then we're going to have a Sith constructor, and um, it's going to uh, return nothing. It's going to be void, so this is sort of UML. Um, this sort of denotes that it is all public at this particular stage with a, a plus. Okay. Um, in UML notation, we're going to have a constructor for Sith, a telekinetic throw, which is returning nothing. This is just a data uh, member. Of course, push lightsaber attack. Combination attack. Now, the combination attack is merely to show you that if you have um, a, a piece of code, you can then um, use the, the, the code that has sort of come previously as well, or is a part of that class. So, the combination attack, you can then call telekinetic throw, force push, lightsaber attack. I love it. Yeah. Print set uh, details as well. Uh, so, that's uh, going to be a code that you are going to then uh, sort of reuse. Um, so that's the sort of main class that you're constructing. So in the lab, that's all uh, sort of outlined for you. Great. Right, the next thing is Sith Lord. Now, a Sith Lord is going to have a, a damage multiplier, and it's going to have an apprentice of type Sith. So you've actually got, uh, you're going to have an example um, of an object within a, 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 another object as well. So you get Sith Lord, um, and that constructor is going to have name, damage multiplier, power level, and then uh, as a sort of um, sort of um, constructor variable, you're going to throw in the, the, the name as well. 
He's going to have a, a lightning attack, be able to see into the future. He's going to be able to save his apprentice as well. So it's going to be a special combination uh, attack uh, as well, um, which will probably uh, use the um, combination attack in here. Good stuff. Then you're going to set apprentice, so that's actually uh, setting Darth Vader to his apprentice by taking in um, a Sith uh, variable or a Sith object um, as a parameter. Okay. Then you're going to print uh, the apprentice details, so that's quite good. So the class Sith will look something like this. Now, when you're actually constructing this, I'll try and uh, outline it as much as possible in the lab, as I always do. Um, but when you're constructing this, do use this. I do not have them on the slides for the good of my health. You could possibly just copy and paste all of this in to give you a head start in the era of Senate. Okay, so that's how you would actually construct your, your, your Sith class, okay? Now, the only thing I'm sort of asking for you to do there is realize that um, you're filling in force push, lightsaber attack, combination attack, and printing out the Sith details. Now, you should be able to sort of do that by yourself. Um, I've given you an example here, yeah? And that can actually be coded within the class as well. Um, so that, 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 that's good, no problem there. Then you've got your Sith Lord class. Uh, once again, I'm just at, 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 here's all the sort of basic code. All I'm asking is that you make a few sort of little additions, analyze everything. This should take you approximately, uh, it can take people from about three hours to about 10 hours, uh, depending. Um, so the idea is that you should be pulling your hair out a little bit, but not too much, okay? So you've got your uh, damage multiplier, You've got public Sith of type, uh, sorry, apprentice of type Sith, okay? And of course, Sith Lord inherits from Sith, okay? So, good. Then you've got your Sith Lord constructor. Now, remember and copy this out entirely, okay? Otherwise, uh, you get confused with this. So you've got to sort of reference the base name, the base class, okay? Uh, and then you're setting all of these things, okay? You've got your, your lightning attack. I've got it in the, the lab uh, notes exactly what to sort of put in these. See the future, every day is proceeding as I have foreseen. It's just outputting something to the screen, it's cool. Um, save apprentice, get a medical capsule immediately, okay? Lightning attack, power, unlimited power, I think. Uh, that's what I put. Um, then your combination attack. Um, you're actually using the combination attack from the base class, which is awesome. This is just the best example of inheritance ever. I am a genius. Let's go back. Okay, so combination attack, you're using it from the base class. It's wonderful. And um, lightning attack as well. And then you're setting your apprentice, okay? Who's going to be Darth Vader, because you're going to be Darth Sidious, okay? And then you're actually um, saying print uh, apprentice details. And then because uh, the apprentice is in fact a Sith object, yes, the base class that you're inheriting from, then you can say apprentice doc print Sith details using the functionality from the base class. Oh yeah, fantastic. Love it. Absolutely wonderful. The main pseudocode, and that's all outlined in the lab sheet, you're going to be uh, creating a Sith, print create a Sith, create a new Sith object called Vader, print a blank line, that, I'm going into that level of detail by the way, not to give you that sort of um, nice um, neat picture face. Print Vader details, print a blank line again, perform Vader combination attack, print creating a Sith Lord, create a Sith Lord called Sidious with damage um, 10 of 10 multiplier um, and 20 force level power, print a blank line, print Sidious details, print a blank line, call Sidious special combination attack method, Call Sidious see future method. Call Sidious save apprentice method. Set Sidious apprentice to Vader. That's a tough one. Um, it shouldn't be that tough. Print a blank line. Call Sidious print apprentice details, which should of course print Vader's details. It's amazing. It's just wonderful. When I concocted this, I was with a cross trader uh, years ago, and it's just amazing how my mind works at times. Sometimes, oh. Right, so tips. When you're trying to get things to compile and they are coated in red, 
then fix them. Try to understand what the problem is. Sitting there and just going, oh, I'm running it again, I'm running it again, it's not, it's not going to magically just all click into place. The programming language is not an anthropomorphic being that can understand what the hell you're trying to do. You've got to make sure that everything is prescriptive and correct in order for it to work. Okay? You can Google things as well. That's the way programmers actually work in the real world. They're constantly Googling things, they're constantly making use of online help, online forums, all that sort of thing. So you've got to have this sort of appreciation of everything that you get access to and use it. Yes? Because that's what you're going to be doing in real life um, when you get a job. Use the C-sharp hints. It will give you hints to try and have a look at them, try to interpret them. Don't just compile over and over again. Year after year, I go into the lab and there's someone going, it's not working, it's not working. I'm pressing it again, it's not working. It's not, it's not working because it's not correct. You haven't put the code in correctly. You have not inputted the code correctly. Um, so therefore, hitting compile or run over and over again is not going to get the damn thing to work. So make peace with that um, and fiddle about the code. Okay, hey, fantastic, great. Here's another thing that I wanted to sort of show you as well. Let me just open this one. Is this going to work? Oh, no, no. Let me bring that. Okay, so this is kind of what the, 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 the code sort of looks like, okay? So you've got all of that that I've actually put in uh, there. Um, that's fine. You get your class set. That's all within the class program. Class set. So it's all in one file okay then you're putting all of that in when i say print sif details and things like that it's i am a sif log use your knowledge before console.write line console.write line console.write line okay yes and then you're going to go to the sif log uh, which inherits from sif you've also got public sif apprentice so that's going to be uh, darth vader eventually in this scenario um then you've got this here your constructor You've got your lightning attacks, so you're printing out all of these sort of uh, damage points as well. Um, you've got see the future, everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. Let's see his apprentice, um, there he is, he has a medical capsule. Uh, special combination attack, right? So you're using combination attack from the base class, then lightning attack, you're calling these, okay? Then public uh, void set apprentice, remember, that these are voids, they return nothing, okay? So they're just sort of uh, methods that return nothing, okay? So you can set a parenthesis, that takes in uh, a Sith object as a parameter, okay? So you've got to sort of generalize that. Now you can obviously pass in any Sith um, in order to make it generic, okay? So you get Sith A, you fire that into the um, set a parenthesis, and then, of course, the apprentice up here becomes equal to what you've passed in. Be easy. Hmm. Then you're uh, saying, oh, okay, I am uh, a Sith Lord and my apprentice has the following details. So, apprentice dot print Sith details from the base class. Wonderful. Oh my God. Sometimes, my Jesus, astounds me. Okay, so. But very, very simple exercises as well. Right, so main um, procedure. You're creating a Sith. Sith Vader equals new Sith Vader. I've got all of that uh, in, the, in the lab sheets, hopefully. Uh, and you should be able to sort of uh, derive that from what I'm saying. Um, and printing a new line. Printing the Sith details. So it's Vader dot. When you select dot on these things, you should gain access immediately. It should pop up like a little list. Um, so if you say Vader, that's a Sith object. Dot, it should pop up like a little list. Exactly all of the functionality, the members, um, the, the methods that you've got access to. Um, and that should be indicative of the fact that your program is constructed properly. If it's not appearing, if you're selecting dot all the time and nothing is appearing, something is wrong, okay? Fair enough, right. There's a blank line again, then you're saying Vader.combination attack. So that's all you're doing when I say you're calling um, Vader's combination attack. Vader.combination attack, if that's done properly. Um, creating a new Sith log, 
um, you've got the constructor there, you're passing in Sidious, the damage multiplier, the, the strength, yeah? Then Sidious dot print set details. So this should all appear in a nice itemized list of everything. Um, and that's the way that the sort of main program should be constructed. So Sidious dot special combination attack, Sidious dot see the future, Sidious dot stay behind it, and you should be able to more or less tab your way through that. Uh, and that is the beauty of it. Um, when the base classes and all the classes are constructed well, then you're simply uh, hitting dot, that should appear, and then uh, semicolon, more or less, uh, after putting in the, uh, hopefully, you don't have to put these in manually, or maybe you do, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, we'll have a nice and engagement meeting next uh, week. Again, this is sort of part of the assessment, so work through all of this, um, and we'll decide exactly how, how much uh, it's, it's going to be worth it at some stage. We'll have that discussion next week as well, um, and see what people are actually wanting to do with the, the assessments in terms of how well um, we're actually sort of getting on. Okay, right, okay, have a, a good crack at it and uh, have a good week. See you later, my little pals.